Hi everyone. In this lecture we're going to talk about material from chapter 11 which focuses on emotion. First we'll talk about fear. We'll first look at the components of the emotional response of fear and then we'll look at research with both laboratory animals and research with human participants that can help inform us about how we exhibit the emotional response of fear and physiologically what that looks like. First, we can take a look at the three components of the emotional response of fear itself. We say that it has three components. So behavioral, which is the muscular movements associated with the fear response. And then the autonomic response, which could be um, the ability to move vigorously. Um, it could be an increased heart rate, things like that. And then also hormonal, which would um, kind of reinforce the autonomic responses of the increased heart rate, um, quickening of your breathing and things like that. Here in this figure, we can kind of see how all three of these components, behavioral, autonomic, and hormonal components come together to form the emotional response that we would say um, is fear. So what we know from research with laboratory animals is that the amygdala is really the part of the brain that becomes very active when we are exposed to emotionally relevant stimuli. The amygdala is located in the temporal lobes of the brain and it's divided into about 12 different regions, but we focus on three major regions, which are the lateral nucleus, the basal nucleus, and the central nucleus. The first area we look at within the amygdala is the lateral nucleus. This is going to be the area that receives information or signals from your neocortex. Then from there, those signals move on to the basal nucleus. And then finally, the central nucleus is going to receive signals or information from both the lateral and the basal nuclei. Also, this area has neurons that project into other areas of the brain, like the hypothalamus, the midbrain, pons, and medulla. So we think that this particular section here is going to be what's responsible for um, a lot of different emotional responses. Um, in particular, it could be tied more to the physiological reaction that you feel when you have, um, when you're experiencing emotions such as fear. Looking more closely at the central nucleus, we think that this is really the most important part of the brain when we're thinking about the expression of emotional responses that are provoked in particular by something negative or aversive. So, Fear is a great example. So something that provokes the fear emotion in you. Um, neurons here in this area of the central nucleus become activated when threatening stimuli are being perceived. So for example, animals might show physiological or behavioral signs of fear and agitation when um, cells in this particular area are stimulated. So your feelings of fear, the physiological symptoms of fear, we would say, um, are likely due to activation in this particular area of the, the amygdala. We also think that this particular area is responsible for the harmful effects of long-term stress. So those long-term effects of the feelings of stress or feelings of fear, um, the harmful effects of feeling this way long-term we think that that is again due to stimulation within this area. And in, interestingly, in laboratory animals, when this particular area has lesioning, they find that animals don't have the same fear response. So even if they're exposed to things that they should be fearful of, for an example, um, there was one study that looked at monkeys with lesioning in this area. Monkeys tend to be very fearful of snakes, but the monkeys that had the lesions in this area of the brain didn't exhibit the same fear responses. So it does seem like the central nucleus is really tied into our physiological or autonomic reactions or feelings that we um, tie into the emotion of fear. And here this figure from your book is showing us some important brain regions that are receiving input from the central nucleus. So all of these areas of the brain are receiving projections of um, signaling from the central nucleus. So these are all tied into 
um, responses to negative or aversive stimuli. So um, again, fear is a great example. So if we look at a few specific areas here, if we look at the periaqueduct gray matter here, that area is being stimulated um, by the central nucleus. And when that happens, that's correlated with behavioral arrest or the response of freezing. So literally freezing. Um, and then also the ventral tegmental area. For example, we see that correlated with behavioral arousal. So that could be um, an increase in behavior exhibited um, that's tied into uh, the dopamine system. Uh, lastly, the parabrachial nucleus, that um, activation from the central nucleus into this area is correlated with increased respiration or more rapid breathing. So we see again um, how much the central nucleus contributes to the feelings of uh, things such as fear or more specifically reaction to negative or aversive stimuli. So how does fear happen in the first place? I mean, if you've had any behavioral course in the past, you've probably learned that most fear is classically conditioned. We can also think about this as emotional conditioning. So basically it happens when you take some kind of neutral stimulus, but you pair it with something that is emotion producing. So something that you might be fearful of. If you think back to, um, if you've had a learning or a behavioral course, you learned about little Albert and how they would present the white bunny or the white rat to little Albert. Initially, he didn't care. So it was a neutral stimulus. He didn't have any kind of fear response to it, but they started to pair uh, the bunny or the rat with a loud gong sound behind little Albert. And little Albert was very afraid of the gong sound. It was very loud. He would cry when they, when they banged the gong. So that was an emotion producing stimulus, right? But when they paired the previously neutral bunny or rat with the banging of the gong, sure enough, little Albert would start to cry when they presented just the bunny or the rat alone without the gong. So basically they conditioned an emotional reaction or an emotional response, in this case fear, to what was previously neutral. And this is going to produce fear reactions for some time, in particular if the pairings continue or the pairings of the um, neutral stimulus and the emotion producing stimulus continue. What we do know is that damage to the amygdala interferes with the effects of emotions on memory. So um, this emotional conditioning can be affected if you have amygdala damage. So if we take a look at how we might condition fear and observe how conditioned fear works in a laboratory environment, we might do something like this with a rat. So basically what's happening here is we are pairing an environment with shock. So here, our little rat, our little guy here, is in an environment where there is a blue floor, and he's being shocked. And what you find over time is that the animal will start to exhibit a freezing behavior. So they'll just stay in one corner of the floor, for example, and just freeze. Now, what happens if you condition this fear response or this freezing response in this rat um, due to shock, and then you move them into a different environment? where they're not being shocked. So now you move your, your rat into an area where there is a purple floor and you're not shocking this rat anymore. Then you're going to find the animal will start to display a no fear related behavior. So they start to explore. They start to wander around. They're no longer freezing, okay? So now let's take it a step further. We know we can condition fear in a rat, but what if we want to observe the effects of conditioning and then extinguishing behavior? So basically we're trying to see what does emotional memory look like? And can we extinguish behaviors? And then can we retrieve them later? Um, if we wanna go a little bit further than we did in the last slide, we might do something like this. So we see here, we're going to condition fear in our little rat. So we're gonna have that blue floor that shocks the rat. And then once we have that freezing response happening, we're going to split the rats into two groups and we're gonna move them into extinction. So this is where we stop shocking them. So one group of rats, they're going to be in extinction in a purple floor environment. The other group is going to be in a green floor environment. Neither rat is going to be shocked, right? We're in extinction. So we wanna wait and see when they start to explore again. Sure enough, both rats 
groups are going to start to explore because they're not being shocked when they're in the green floor environment or the purple floor environment. And then we do what's called a retrieval task. We want to see if we can retrieve the fear response. So the group that had the purple floor environment moves to the purple floor um, retrieval test and they keep exploring like they were in extinction so their behavior doesn't change. But the group that was on the green floor that was exploring, not being shocked when they're moved to the purple floor environment in the retrieval test, they start to freeze again. So this demonstrates to us that there hasn't been That is, the rat has not forgotten being shocked because if they had, they would start to move around readily and explore much like the top group, but they don't do that. They freeze. So this demonstrates that the emotional response, the fear response that has been conditioned has not been forgotten. So extinction in certain environments does not equal forgotten emotional memory. Experienced Now, just considering quickly research with humans, we know that people also acquire conditioned emotional responses, much like what I just described with the rats. It's very similar with humans. Um, we have emotional conditioning of some emotional response, and we can also then go through the period of extinction where we um, experience a, an environment where we're no longer experiencing a negative outcome, for example. And so we start to behave as we did previously before we experienced the negative outcome. And then we can then place the person in a different environment and notice that they might have some recovery of that um, emotional um, response. So we would say that this is some sort of emotional memory. So even though you can extinguish a certain type of responding, it doesn't mean that that memory of that emotional conditioning is gone. We do have emotional memory um, and we do think that, that is tied into the amygdala. Next we'll take a look at aggression. We're going to look at research with laboratory animals, then we're going to take a look at research with humans, and then finally hormonal control of aggressive behaviors. I think about aggression as being more species typical behaviors. Um, specifically, the type of aggression that we see is usually specific to the species that we're observing. And a lot of times these behaviors are related to reproduction. So, for example, males competing with each other trying to obtain a mate, for example. Um, some aggression can look like um, threat behavior. So threatening an individual um, could, could also be more defensive behavior. Um, even submissive behavior for um, submissive uh, members of the species, if they're being, um, if they're if they're trying to show their submission to the dominant member of a pack, for example, they may exhibit submissive behavior. Um, and then finally, um, related to predation, so actually hunting for food. All of these types of behaviors fall under types of aggressive behavior. We can look at research with laboratory animals to tell us a bit more about the neural circuitry that's involved in aggression. Um, specifically, if we look at the connections between the paraaqueductal gray matter and the hypothalamus and the amygdala. So specifically, we think that the hypothalamus and the amygdala seem to influence both attack and predation behaviors. And this would be through both excitatory and inhibitory connections with the PHE. So excitatory meaning increasing the likelihood of these behaviors and inhibitory meaning um, more uh, likely to inhibit or reduce these behaviors. So it seems like there is a connection between the hypothalamus and amygdala and the PAG as it relates to it, both attack and predation behaviors. If we look more closely at neural activity, if we want to focus on neurotransmitters that seem to play a large role in aggressive behaviors, again, looking at laboratory animals, we found that there seems to be a pretty predominant role of serotonin. Um, in particular, activity of serotonergic synapses seems to inhibit aggression. So 
more activity in the serotonergic system seems to reduce aggressive behavior. And we've seen this in monkey studies. So specifically, monkeys that have the lowest levels of serotonin seem to show more aggressive behavior and show more of a pattern of risk-taking behavior than do monkeys with higher levels of serotonin. We think that levels of serotonin being higher may be correlated with being able to control um, risky behavior, or essentially higher levels of serotonin may even exert um, control over risky behavior. So then if we were to reduce serotonin levels, um, we may also see an increase in aggression behavior, and we could maybe try to generalize that onto human aggression and other forms of antisocial behavior as well. Here we're looking at some data from the experiment that I mentioned in the previous slide, looking at monkeys and serotonin levels. Here we're looking at serotonin levels of male monkeys, and we're, we're considering this in the framework of risk-taking behavior. So what they did was they measured the cerebral spinal fluid contents of these male monkeys, and they measured specifically the serotonin levels in their cerebral spinal fluid. Then four years later, they noted whether or not those monkeys were still living or if they had died. And that's what we're looking at here on this graph. We're looking at the percentage of male monkeys alive or dead as a function of the levels of serotonin that was in their cerebral spinal fluid four years prior. And what they found was that the monkeys that had the lower levels of serotonin were much more likely to be dead four years later. Whereas the monkeys who had the higher levels of serotonin were more likely to be alive four years later. And what they gleaned from this was that it seemed as though lower levels of serotonin were correlated or was correlated with more risk-taking behavior. So these individuals were more likely to fight. They were more likely to try to do higher jumps um, and risk falling, et cetera. So um, quite an interesting study. Considering aggression in humans, um, we do acknowledge that heredity can play a significant role in aggressive behavior. And as you might expect, um, aggressive behavior is more common in males than in females. Um, but in relation to the heredity, um, aspect, what we found is that more recent studies suggest that um, we've, we have a variety of genes that are associated with human aggression. Um, most of them include signaling in the serotonin and the dopamine system. And I don't think that this is particularly surprising in the context of the study that we just looked at in monkeys. So um, we find you know, further support for things like serotonin playing a very large role in aggressive behavior in humans as well. Further considering the role of serotonin and aggressive behaviors in humans, we do think that more activity in the serotonin system does seem to inhibit aggressive behaviors. And we've seen that when we viewed destruction of serotonergic axons. So um, the destruction of axons that project into the forebrain that are um, serotonin uh, cells, um, we have found that that kind of facilitates aggressive attack or making uh, aggressive attacks just more likely to happen in those individuals. And um, another thing that we found is that a serotonin agonist, so something that improves the serotonin system or makes the serotonin system just more active, can decrease irritability and aggressiveness while also reducing impulsive acts as well. So again, further support that uh, a more active serotonin system, a more healthy serotonin system correlates with less aggressive behaviors. We look at the role hormones play in controlling aggressive behavior. Um, we can kind of compare and contrast females and males, and we do know as a general rule, females tend to be less aggressive than males, and female aggression oftentimes seems to be correlated with a higher level of testosterone in the system. We look at males um, in rodents, for example, um, we find that androgen secretion um, does occur in the womb and then decreases and then increases again um, during puberty. So we see more aggressiveness during puberty, um, which makes sense because a lot of times aggressive acts are in some relation to reproductive um, success or trying to be reproductively successful 
trying to gain a mate, um, fighting another individual for a mate, for example. So it makes sense why aggressive acts in uh, male rodents, for example, and in male humans as well, tends to increase during puberty. Here we're looking at um, female rats and we're looking at aggressive behaviors and we're looking at um, different drug administrations. So we're looking at estradiol and we're looking at testosterone and placebo. And the main point here is that we see more fights in female rats when they're given testosterone compared to both placebo and estradiol. So this is just lending a bit of support that testosterone in females or higher levels of testosterone in females is correlated with more aggressive behaviors. This is quite interesting. Here we're looking at mouse fetuses. And the, we have research to suggest that um, female fetuses, so if we're looking here, we see female, female, male, male, female, female, um, because uh, testosterone um, begins to be produced in the womb the male fetuses are going to have levels of testosterone early in development here in the womb. And there is research that if females are housed in between or next to a male fetus, they're gonna be more likely to have higher levels of testosterone than if they were not housed in the womb next to a male sibling. So for example, if we look at OM here, this female is not near um, a male sibling. So this female is going to be more likely to have lower levels of testosterone when compared to especially 2M here. This female has a male on either side. And because these males are, um, are going to have testosterone present in their system and they're going to have that produced, this female is going to be more likely to be exposed to that and just by being housed next to them, have higher levels of testosterone as well. And then in turn, they may be more likely to be more aggressive later on. Here we're looking further into the effects of testosterone, specifically on social aggressive behavior. And this was done with rats. This was done with male rats. And we're looking at the time in which testosterone was given. So we have three separate groups here. And if we look at immediately after birth, we have one group that got a placebo, no testosterone. We got two groups that did get testosterone. And the argument here is that testosterone early is going to have what is called an organizational effect. So getting testosterone earlier on um, is basically going to um, lead to the development or the modification of the brain and making your neural circuitry um, more responsive to testosterone in the future. Doesn't mean that you're going to be aggressive, it just means that um, later on, if you're exposed to testosterone, you might be more sensitive to its effects, that's all. So if we look then, um, when the rat is then fully grown, if testosterone is given, but they had a placebo after birth, the resulting behavior is still low in aggressiveness. So it's almost like that organizational effect never happened, like because they weren't exposed to it, um, to testosterone early on, that um, sensitivity in their system was never kind of uh, developed. So it didn't really matter if they were exposed to testosterone later in life, it didn't change their level of aggressiveness. Whereas if we look at the two groups that did get testosterone immediately after birth, um, one of those groups didn't get an injection when they were fully grown and they still had low aggressiveness. So them having the initial testosterone injection after birth um, led to an organizational effect, we think, of their neural circuitry and them being more sensitive to testosterone, but they weren't given testosterone later on, so that aggressiveness never really kicked in. Whereas the third group was given testosterone as an adult as well, and we call this an activational effect. So they got the testosterone early in life, their system became kind of developed and sensitized to respond better to it, and then they were given testosterone again when they were fully grown. And so their system was very responsive to it. And then the resulting behavior there is high aggressiveness. And again, we take this as just more converging evidence that higher levels of testosterone are um, 
definitely related to aggressive behavior, or definitely seem to be, according to the data that we have. And additionally, when you're exposed to testosterone matters, specifically if you're given um, it very young, and then also, again, as an adult, um, more likely that you're going to exhibit more aggressive behavior. At least if we are looking at this, these rat data, that's what they suggest. Just kind of setting up the effect of androgens or sex hormones. Um, if we look at prenatally, uh, we see increases in aggressive behavior in all species that have been studied, and that includes primates. Um, so if these androgens didn't really have an effect on aggressive behavior, then we as humans, we would be the exception to the rule um, when we look at all of the data that we have collected. So it does seem like it matters. Um, and then after puberty, androgens also begin to have activational effects. So testosterone, right? Um, the effects of your environment, steroids, et cetera, those things after puberty can have that activational effect to really kick in your system um, and, and kind of activate that circuitry that's very responsive to testosterone and lead to more aggressive behaviors. If we think about how a variety of different species might structure their um, social status, so what is going to lead to higher social status in a given species? If we focus in on you know, humans, but also even rodents, um, we, could, we could maybe say it's probably pretty similar. Um, if you wanna be a high status individual, you have to be able to exhibit certain characteristics. And it is likely that high status might be correlated with higher levels of testosterone, more likely to be independent, more likely to fight an individual for superiority or getting the upper hand. Um, just being able to achieve a higher status position and then being able to fight to defend that position. There are other things that could factor in like motivation and things like that. But in general, it, it, it's not a far leap to, to think about high status being pretty related to levels of testosterone. Kind of continuing on with uh, being high status, high social status. Um, we could think about that as being kind of the dominant individuals in the pack or in the troop versus the subordinate or submissive members within the troop. And if we look at monkeys, there tends to be a dominant monkey within the group, and then there tends to be more um, subordinates. So if we focus on males in particular, here we're looking at squirrel monkeys. There tends to be a few dominant monkeys, maybe even just one in a group of monkeys, and then all the rest are subordinate. The ones that are subordinate or submissive may not even be allowed to mate, period, because the dominant monkey is going to be the one to mate with all of the females. They're going to be more reproductively successful. They're also going to be the ones that are more likely to be aggressive. Um, and this would be particularly true during mating season because they're going to be fighting these subordinate monkeys when it's necessary or fighting with another dominant monkey if that, were, if that instance were to happen. Um, but in general, the subordinate or submissive monkeys tend not to fight because they, they're, they're going to get beat. Um, so they wanted to see if being dominant versus subordinate would play a role if they introduced a substance into the mix. And they gave these monkeys alcohol. And they observed aggressive behavior in both mating season and non-mating season. And they also took note if the monkey was a subordinate monkey or a dominant monkey. And what's interesting here is that they found for the monkeys that were subordinate, it didn't matter if it was mating season or non-mating season, or if they were in the control groups and got no alcohol, or if they were in the alcohol groups, their behavior really didn't change. So here we're looking at aggressive behavior. And we note here the blue lines, those lines don't fluctuate. So no real change in their behavior. But where we see alcohol play a huge role, it seems like, is when we look at the dominant monkeys. So we see more aggressive behavior in the dominant monkeys during mating season overall. Anyway, that makes sense, even in the controls. But if we look in the alcohol dominant monkeys, tons more aggressive behavior. So it really does seem like the addition to alcohol here really increased the aggressive behaviors in the dominant monkeys. And we even see that trend to some extent in non-mating season as well. So this suggests that 
There is a social hierarchy probably correlated with levels of testosterone, but also that can be exacerbated even more by adding a substance like alcohol to the mix. Again, more likely to increase aggressive behavior in more dominant individuals. We'll look at impulse control. So we're going to look at the role of a certain area of the brain on your ability to control your impulses. We're also going to focus on, um, in particular, moral decision making. So how you make decisions and how emotions play into your decision making process. First, we'll focus on the role of the VMPFC for short, or the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, we think that this area of the brain seems to um, inhibit emotional behavior, such as impulsive violence or aggression. So basically, this area of the brain is, is really correlated with your ability to not act super impulsively. But if you had damage to this particular area, it might cause serious impairment in your ability to control yourself when it comes to decision making or just being incredibly impulsive. Um, we really think a big consequence here would be emotional dysregulation. And um, for example, if you remember from you know, your previous psychology courses, you've probably heard of Phineas Gage. He had that steel rod go through his head and he had damage to his BMPFC. And as a result, a lot of people reported that he seemed like a different person and was um, more impulsive. More specifically, we think the VMPFC seems to guide emotional reactions to certain moral judgments. So basically, your ability to let your emotions sway your ability to make decisions. Um, so it basically, your, your decisions that you make a lot of times aren't just the result of rational, logical decision making, right? Um, there are other things that, that really factor in. And a lot of times they tend to be more emotional. And this is your, at least we think, um, activity in your VMPFC. So again, individuals that have damage to this area seem to be able to make decisions without any kind of strong emotional component playing a role. So they tend to be very practical when choosing a solution. And I'll give you an example. Here we're looking at a conveyor belt task. So basically on the conveyor belt, uh, for example, there might be a live snake and they have participants that reported that they were afraid of snakes and other participants that said that they weren't. So we're gonna focus on the ones that said that they were afraid of snakes. Um, they were measuring brain activity, so they were doing an fMRI scan as this activity was being done. And they found that in the participants that said they were afraid of snakes, when they decided to move the conveyor belt to where the snake was moving away from them, they didn't see any activity in the VMPFC, but when they moved the snake closer to themselves, so even though they said they were afraid, they moved the conveyor belt closer to get the snake closer to them, they saw activity in the VMPFC. And the researchers took this as evidence of courage or an emotional component to a decision, right? that they were essentially being brave or having courage to move the snake closer to them, even though they were afraid of it. And they are using the activity that they found in the VMPFC as evidence of this or for, uh, for support of this. Something else that also affects our ability to control our impulses is just our brain development as a general rule. We most of the time think about impulsive violence, for example, being more due to just your inability to regulate yourself emotionally. And we know that the amygdala, as we've talked about multiple times throughout this lecture so far, plays a role in anger and violent emotional reactions. And we know that the development of your prefrontal cortex really helps in your ability to control these violent emotions. But this development does not happen at a young age. It happens you know, a bit later on in life. Here, if we're looking at children, for example, um, we see more um, development in the amygdala than in the prefrontal cortex, right? So that basically means that children are gonna be able to react 
to negative things and exhibit things like aggression, for example, or just be more risky, but they're not going to have the development in the prefrontal cortex yet to be able to, to kind of mitigate what um, the activity in the, the amygdala. So if we look at adolescence, it's leveling off a little bit, but we still have the amygdala being more fully developed. So they are more able to react, you know, impulsively, but they're not as able to kind of think it through. Prefrontal cortex isn't as developed yet. The two don't really even out until adulthood. That's when we see the prefrontal cortex kind of catch up to the amygdala. And that's, you know, kind of why we usually tend to think about decision making and impulsivity um, kind of leveling off more into adulthood when we compare that to both children and adolescents purely because our prefrontal cortex isn't quite developed enough to be able to deal with what's kind of going on in other areas of our brain yet. If we look at our emotional reactions, right, and, and we kind of think about the role of the prefrontal cortex, we can look at moral judgment activities and we can kind of take a look at decisions that we might make and whether or not they're driven by emotion or not. Here is a classic example. First, we'll look on the left. This is the classic trolley problem. So you have a trolley and it can go one of two ways. And if it goes one way, it is going to run over one person and that one person will die or it can go to the other side and it will run over five people and they will die. And you have to be the person to throw the switch to decide which way the trolley goes. Now, uh, this is obviously not a good problem either way, but most people can pretty readily decide to go ahead and throw the switch toward the one person because obviously we note that one person is, is, while it's awful, it's not as bad as five people. But when you shift the problem over slightly and we look over at the right-hand side and you tell someone that this trolley can either hit these five people on the tracks below or you can push this man in front of the trolley and it will stop the trolley and those five people will live. When you give people this problem, they have a much harder time and a much more kind of internal turmoil happening or emotional reaction, if you will, because they have to play a more active role. In the first problem, they were throwing the switch, but they weren't physically pushing someone in front of the trolley. People tend to have a lot harder time deciding to actually push somebody in front of the trolley versus throwing the switch. And again, the two problems are the same. It's one person versus five, but it's something about being a more active participant and actually having to push someone that changes the decision in a way and makes it a lot more of an emotional decision. And it makes it harder for people to choose. 